welcome everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Charles Toth, the chair of the biology department, and I'm here to introduce the inaugural Humanity of Science uh, lecture series. What I thought was an important idea for campus is to have a broad conversation about science, the, uh, the role of science in, uh, I guess, student information and student classes, and I think there's biology classes, chemistry classes, honors classes, um, global studies classes, there's a variety of different uh, departments and programs that are here, which is exciting to see. And so what I thought was an interesting topic to cover today is uh, climate change. And I thought that's going to be an interest not only to students here, but also uh, as they leave here and are part of society and for their employment and their careers uh, post-PC. So I thought the Humanity of Science lecture series would be an important way to uh, discuss the impact of science. This is the first one. We're going to do it every semester, uh, starting now through the fall. And the interesting thing as we get to spring semesters is that we're going to tie in the lecture series with the DWC colloquia and make sure the topic of interest for the speaker is related to one of the particular colloquia so that we can also introduce that through the core uh, curriculum. And today's speaker, Dr. Gary Kleiman, is a senior environmental specialist at the World Bank. Started his life in uh, Bedford, Mass., so he's a local uh, New Englander. Went to uh, Colorado and Boulder to uh, go into chemistry and, and um, phys physics and math for his bachelor's, and then to physics and astronomy at UMass Amherst. Ended up at MIT in atmospheric chemistry for his doctorate. And for a while, in the, in the 2000s, he was at the uh, NESCOM organization, the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management, where he was the science and technology program manager and for the last couple years has been the um, specialist with the uh, World Bank. So we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Kleiman talk about development and climate change, how cutting pollution can slow warming and save lives, as he's going to uh, talk about now. So thanks, Gary. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? In the back of the room? Yeah. Um, yeah, I really want to thank Chuck for a great introduction and uh, thank the uh, College of Arts and Sciences more broadly for hosting this uh, series. I think it's a, a great idea and I think the connection between humanity and uh, the sciences is an important one and I think this is a great topic actually to uh, uh, to kick off this series uh, given the linkages between uh, uh, humanity and science, but uh, development and climate change, uh, what I really want to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit more narrowly about short-lived climate pollutants, one um, sort of subset of uh, the uh, various uh, forces that you know, can impact climate change. But really, development and climate change more broadly is how I want to start. I do need to give my uh, disclaimer. I'm speaking here today as an individual, not as a representative of the World Bank, although all of the work that I'll be presenting uh, that the World Bank did is publicly available. I brought some uh, 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 props with me, so feel free to come up and peruse some of these reports, but I'm speaking as an uh, individual scientist today, not on behalf of the World Bank, although happy to speak uh, to what the, the World Bank is doing on uh, climate change. Um, so just in terms of an outline for this talk, I will be starting with this broader theme, uh, giving you some context on the relationship between climate change and development. Uh, and how it affects uh, the World Bank. Um, and uh, then I'll move in uh, more to this topic of uh, short-lived climate pollutants and explain exactly what I mean by short-lived climate pollutants and uh, what the role uh, of these short-lived climate pollutants are in terms of socioeconomic indicators like health and agriculture and things like that. Um, one of the reasons that I think this topic is appropriate for a series on humanity of science is I, I'm not sure how many of you caught the uh, op-ed in yesterday's Wall Street Journal that was written by uh, Ted Nordhaus, uh, an economist at Yale University, and Michael Schellenberger. It's called Global Warming Scare Tactics. And uh, this article makes, I, I think, a relatively good point that the uh, environmental community, especially the environmental communications community, has uh, in some sense done a disservice to uh, the science of climate change because um, they're, they're talking about a new series that's going to be released on Showtime. It's actually being premiered right now in the uh, atrium uh, of the World Bank uh, down in Washington, D.C. by uh, the president. Um, it's called Years of Living Dangerously. And uh, as uh, Nordhaus and Schellenberger lay it out, it's a terrifying uh, trailer 
replete with images of melting glaciers, raging wildfires, and rampaging floods. I don't think scary is the right word in tones one voice, dangerous, definitely. And the point that they're making in this op-ed is that uh, when you lace your communication with uh, danger and um, the, the prospective doom and gloom scenario that uh, climate change realistically does lay out for humanity, um, it tends to turn a lot of people off. And they end their op-ed uh, by saying, uh, these guys actually do believe we need to do something very significant about climate change, by the way. They're not skeptics. They, they do say that you know, communication should focus on how mitigation efforts can promote a better society rather than on the reality of climate change and averting its risks. So it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. You know, you, you, the proper way to communicate about climate change is, ra is rather than focusing on the reality, what we actually face, uh, we really ought to talk about something else. And um, in some ways, I agree with them. And I think that this is a great topic because when we get down to this socioeconomic indicator like health and agriculture and find that a lot of the mitigation strategies that we can undertake now uh, to avert some of the worst outcomes that climate change has in store for us, uh, there are very good reasons to undertake these measures. There's very good reasons to mitigate, very good reasons to adapt, regardless of what you uh, uh, think about uh, the, the science of climate change. So coming back now to the, the broader theme, climate change and development. Why is the World Bank interested in climate change? Well, you can start by asking the question, is this climate change? This is certainly one of the public faces of climate change, right? Polar bears, ice melting, endangering their natural habitat. Yes, this is climate change. But so is this, climate refugees. Flooding is happening now. People are losing their homes, habitable space. So it's not just animals. It's not just the Arctic, it's people and their lives, it's food security, droughts. So this is coming back to some of the doom and gloom stuff that uh, Nordhaus and Schellenberger are talking about. This is real, it's happening now, it's anticipated to increase in the future. I know the biology department is very engaged in a lot of medical research, health, disease-borne vectors. There's a lot of different reasons that the World Bank a financial and economic institution, right? The world's largest development institution focused on economic development for the poorest countries. A lot of reasons why we see climate change as increasingly affecting what we do. As the world's largest development institution, we have a, a new president. I, I can't say new anymore because he's uh, been the president of the World Bank uh, for a little over a year now, Jim Kim. Uh, also relatively local, came from Harvard, but um, was the president of Dartmouth before he took over at uh, the World Bank. Uh, and he uh, says, you know, we will never end poverty if we don't tackle climate change. Um, we are stepping up mitigation and adaptation work throughout our entire business line, looking through the climate lens, because there's no other way we're going to be able to achieve our development mandate. <sighs> Turn down the heat got a lot of attention, although we've, as uh, our World Development Report in 2010 attests, we've been involved with climate change for much longer than uh, one would think. But really, it, uh, we kind of turned a corner with turn down the heat in 2012 uh, because uh, it brought a new sense of uh, attention to the work the World Bank is doing on climate change. People uh, were able to uh, stand up a, a new president with a new voice, uh, stating very clearly what we had known before, but um, stating with uh, 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 increased sincerity that uh, we were not going to be able to achieve our goals. Uh, the World Bank has two goals that drive its work, uh, eliminating extreme poverty within a generation and boosting shared prosperity. What does that mean? Uh, not to throw a lot of numbers at you, but we actually have statistics, extreme poverty, people living on less than $1.25 a day. Within a generation, by 2030, our goal is to reduce the number of people living on less than $1.25 a day to less than 3%. It can be done. It's a bold and ambitious goal. People have been talking about eliminating poverty. We believe we can do it. 
and we have a president who believes that as well, and we are putting all of our efforts towards that. Second, boosting shared prosperity. The bottom 40% of income earners in the world. They need to prosper at the same rate or better than everyone else. That's what we mean by boosting shared prosperity. That's what we mean by eliminating extreme poverty. Turn Down the Heat was born out of the recognition that climate change not only threatens our ability to achieve these goals, but also threatens to erase the past development gains that have been made. We've already made a lot of progress towards these goals, and we're starting to lose ground every time we have a new cyclone that wipes out uh, you know, villages and um, main messages from uh, Turn Down the Heat. As uh, I've already indicated, to some extent, a warmer world uh, will trap millions of people in poverty uh, without ambitious climate action. Uh, we're looking at a two degree world in our lifetime. Uh, a lot of people talk about projections for the end of the century. It's looking more and more likely that we're talking about four degrees by the end of the century. Um, things are happening, uh, uh, many of the worst climate impacts could still be avoided by holding warming below two degrees, but the window for action is rapidly closing. Things, uh, emissions are increasing at a greater rate than uh, we had anticipated. Now there is still a lot of uncertainty in some aspects of the individual uh, uh, climate change impacts, and certainly I acknowledge all of the uncertainty that goes with it, but uh, as the IPCC new assessment uh, this year is showing, you know, we largely the predictions that were made in 2007 are on track. Uh, perhaps the sensitivity uh, to climate is, uh, has somewhat different uncertainty bounds than we thought back in 2007, but the story remains pretty much the same. So in my group, the climate change group at the World Bank, we develop uh, a lot of knowledge products. So there are other aspect or other parts of the World Bank group that are you know, very involved in the field, in the uh, developing countries where we work, our client countries, working you know, in partnership with our uh, client countries. In the climate change group, developing knowledge products, uh, I've already mentioned Turn Down the Heat. Uh, following up on that, there were, uh, my colleagues developed uh, a series of reports, uh, one of which came out last year, Turn Down the Heat 2. Uh, looking at the regional impacts in uh, Africa, uh, S East Asia, and South Asia. Um, we have turned down the heat three, scheduled for release at the end of this year, that will be looking at impacts in Latin America, Caribbean, Middle East, North Africa, uh, Europe, and Central Asia. So looking at these regional impacts, trying to take the, the science that's out there uh, and make it real for our client countries. What are the implications for our clients uh, the developing world, and uh, what are the strategies for dealing with climate change. In addition, last year, uh, in November, we released a report uh, on building resilience. Um, this goes to the loss and damage. Uh, interesting fact, uh, in the late 80s, uh, climate change losses were valued at around $50 billion uh, a year. Um, over the last decade, that number is now $200 billion a year, quadrupled in only 30 years. Now, there are a lot of different reasons why uh, loss and damage uh, are going up, but uh, certainly one aspect of it uh, relates to climate impacts. Um, so we're looking at this not only from the perspective of loss and damage, but also what we can do about it. Adaptation, disaster risk reduction. Um, in 1999, there was a cyclone hit the uh, east coast of India. 10,000 people were killed. Four and a half billion dollars worth of economic damage as a result of that storm. Don't ever say lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place, because uh, in 2013, another cyclone, a similar magnitude, hit the exact same part of the Indian coast on the east, eastern side of India. This time, only 40 people were killed and only $700 million in damage, less than $1 billion in damage. What was the difference? Working with our, oh sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, working with uh, our partners in those countries uh, and other international financial institutions, there's been a lot of work done by the Indian government to prepare for cyclone impacts. Uh, you know, storm shelters, 
different uh, agricultural uh, uh, innovations that can use uh, strains that are more, uh, or varieties of, of crops that are more resilient to stormwater or saltwater intrusion. Uh, uh, preparation plans, uh, disaster risk reduction, building more resilient hardware. We now look at you know, Hurricane Sandy in New York City, and now they're renovating all of the buildings to have the, the furnaces and the, the electric works and stuff on the roof instead of in the basement. These are basic steps, planning steps, development steps that can be taken that actually can reduce uh, the, the risk that uh, society faces and allow us to adapt to uh, the inevitable impacts that we are looking at. Uh, and there are other steps that we can take to hopefully avert the most extreme of the projected impacts. And so what I work on uh, is more the mitigation side of things. How do we try to avoid some of these most extreme outcomes that we're facing? Uh, well, short-lived climate pollution is a relatively new term that's been um, used in international circles for uh, a couple of years now. There's a international organization that was started actually um, when Hillary Clinton was in the State Department. I think that uh, six countries came together as partners to form the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which originally had, I think, don't quote me on the, the countries. Well, I, I won't even try. I know uh, Bangladesh, the US, um, Ghana, Nigeria, maybe, well, I don't know. Uh, six countries came together around this topic of, is there something we can do now that would have near-term benefits for the climate, you know, near-term cooling impact, but also uh, make sense for other reasons. And um, short-lived climate pollution is largely thought of in terms of these three species. Black carbon, which is a component of particulate matter, an air pollutant. Uh, methane, which helps uh, in the formation of tropospheric ozone. Both are radiatively active. That is just like CO2. They absorb radiation, trap heat. Uh, and hydrofluorocarbons. But HFCs, which replaced CFCs, um, so ha have a variety of lifetimes in the atmosphere. Some of them are short-lived. Some of them are long-lived. And it's the short-lived HFCs that also contribute. So, why are we interested? Why is the CCAC interested? The World Bank, by the way, is now a partner. It started with six countries. Uh, CCAC now has, uh, I think, uh, upwards of 60 partners, um, more than 30 different countries around the world, plus several international organizations like the World Bank are partners in CCAC. Why are we interested in short-lived climate pollutants? What is the opportunity that we see in this uh, class of pollution? Well, no question, and don't misunderstand the purpose of the my uh, talk, uh, I am not suggesting in any way that carbon dioxide does not remain the main cause of rising temperatures on this planet. We still absolutely need to mitigate carbon dioxide pollution. Until we get a handle on CO2, we're not going to solve our climate problems. And I'll show you graphically, uh, that is with a graph, uh, I will show you why that is the case. Um, Short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, are responsible for up to 40% of current warming. The thing about CO2 is it stays in the atmosphere for more than 100 years. So when we look at the integrated warming, all the warming that we're going to face over the next century, um, you may say, well, why do we care about all of the warming that's happening today? Well, if we were to turn off all of the CO2 emissions on this planet tomorrow, we're still living with that pollution for one, two, three, four hundred years. It takes a long time for CO2 to work its way out of the system. We're going to be living with that warming for a long time. These short-lived climate pollutants, depending on the species, black carbon, it's around you know, a couple of weeks. You know, particulate matter, generally within two weeks, three weeks, it gets rained out, it deposits onto the surface of the earth, it's removed from the atmosphere. But during that two-week period, black carbon can absorb thousands of times more radiation on a pound for pound basis. It's not really a molecule, so you can't say molecule for molecule basis. But it absorbs far more heat than CO2 does. So while it's up there, it's doing a lot of warming. Methane has a lifetime between 8 and 10 years. Um, so it's around for a while. Uh, but if we were to stop emitting methane tomorrow, you know, within a decade, we'd start to see some relief. 
Um, HFCs, as I said, they have a variety of lifetimes, but the short-lived ones, typically we define it as sort of 15 years. You know, anything less than 15 years, we'll call that a short-lived climate pollutant. Um, so, The, the benefit of reducing short-lived climate pollution now is that you can avoid some damages that we may be facing more immediately. Here in the United States, in Western Europe, we are not seeing as often the kinds of things like Hurricane Sandy where climate change impacts are visited upon our front door. In the developing world, as I showed in some of the earlier images, it's already starting to happen and especially at higher latitudes. Um, so we'll talk more about uh, the development aspect in a second. I just want to give you a little bit more background. So what are these SLCPs? Where do they come from? I already mentioned the, oop, the names of the species, black carbon, methane, uh, HFCs. Black carbon is coming from things like diesel engine. It's almost pure black carbon. The soot that comes out of diesel engines is a, a very uh, high percentage of black carbon. Uh, but there are other sources of particulate matter, uh, this form of air pollution that contains black carbon, uh, wood burning stoves, uh, open burning, uh, agricultural burning, uh, brick kilns, a lot of industrial sources, especially coal burning sources, they emit a lot of black carbon. But these other sources also emit other co-pollutants. In fact, some of the co-pollutants are sulfur dioxide or organic carbon. Now, those actually have the opposite effect on the climate, right? You put a lot of sulfur in the atmosphere, that's what one of the things, strategies people are talking about for uh, cooling the planet as a, a geoengineering method. So you have to be careful when you look at these other source categories and say, well, are you removing more black carbon or are you removing more SO2 or are you removing more organic carbon? It gets complicated. But if you study science and uh, you know, uh, st stick through the calculations and, and, and do the, the calculated um, uh, modeling that's necessary to figure out what the net effect is, uh, there are several source categories of black carbon that would actually yield global net benefits for the climate depending on where the reductions take place. And I'll talk about the location in a minute. Uh, methane, uh, it's things uh, like uh, natural gas, uh, gas and oil extraction and leakage from uh, pipelines, wastewater treatment, uh, livestock agriculture, solid waste. All of these are sources of methane, and there are interventions we know about today that can reduce these things. Black carbon is also important because as a component of fine particulate matter, PM is a leading source of risk for health. This is from the Global Burden of Disease, Comparative Risk Assessment. It was published in The Lancet. Uh, Global Burden of Disease looks at all of the risks to health around the world. And they have ranked what are the riskiest things to health and what are the least risky things or what, what's less risky. They've done a comparative risk assessment. And what they found is that uh, high blood pressure, tobacco smoking, alcohol use, those are the things that present the biggest risk to your health. After that, household air pollution. Remember I was talking about cook stoves? Disproportionately affecting women and children in poor countries who are doing most of the cooking, right? Women are cooking in these kitchens with often open burning uh, where the smoke has no exhaust out of their kitchen. So they're breathing very, very high levels of air pollution. Well, turns out that has a health cost and that cost is around four million deaths a year. Similarly, outdoor air pollution uh, I don't know if you've been to uh, Beijing lately or uh, uh, many of the other uh, high pollution countries in uh, East Asia or South Asia, uh, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, in India. You, know, you go to a lot of these uh, countries where air pollution is very high and you will have uh, a far greater risk of suffering disease uh, as a result of ambient air pollution. So, that cost is another three million deaths per year. So you can see now there's a little bit of overlap between these because some of the household air pollution becomes ambient outdoor air pollution. So you can't just add these up. But the point is that air pollution is, has a significant health cost and black carbon reduction, a lot of the mitigation strategies that would remove black carbon, they're also good for health. 
Let's talk about methane for one second. Methane aids in the formation of tropospheric ozone. I don't know, I don't want to get too deep into the chemistry, but tropospheric ozone is probably what you've heard referred to as smog. In air, you know, air pollution in cities, mostly it's smog. It's a combination of smoke and fog. Back in uh, London, they, they, they gave it that name, but uh, uh, in the uh, smog episodes in the you know, uh, 18th century, 19th century. But uh, really, ozone is one of the key contributors to smog, tropospheric ozone, not the stratospheric ozone that uh, blocks UV light and was being destroyed by CFCs. But down at ground level, we also form the same chemical, ozone. And um, it's not good for you. And it's also not good for plants. It's phytotoxic. Here's a healthy leaf, and here's a leaf that's been exposed to high concentrations of ozone. So in urban air pollution, where you have the combination of PM and ozone, you're damaging health, but that ozone spreads out and damages crops. And in fact, you can see uh, by this chart that when you have very high concentrations of ozone, uh, you know, anything above uh, 60, 80 uh, parts per billion of ozone, the yield of various crops drops. In a lot of these developing countries where air pollution is worse, people are hungry. They have food security issues. And here we are pumping up pollution so that their food yield goes down. So there are some real development benefits for trying to reduce ozone. And methane, as I said, eight to 10 year lifetime, it gets uniformly mixed around the globe. It doesn't necessarily form the air pollution that you're breathing in, uh, in you know, downtown urban locations, but the background concentration of ozone about 100 years ago was around 20 parts per billion. Today, it's closer to 40 parts per billion. Why is that background level of ozone going up? That's methane. Methane aids in the formation of tropospheric ozone. It essentially shifts the chemical balance, the whole oxidative capacity in the atmosphere, so that more, a higher level of background ozone is um, uh, achieved at you know, equilibrium. So with higher background levels, now your urban air pollution sits on top of that background. So if your background is now at 40 and your urban air pollution has incursions up into this 60 to 80 region more frequently, you're going to have a harder time growing crops. So we've talked about health. We've talked about crops. Those are the reasons why we care about um, short-lived climate pollutants from a local development perspective. That's why our clients are really interested in this topic. How do we reduce SLCPs? Well, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, all of these interventions. You can read the slide. But in transport, in energy, agriculture, in urban, you know, dealing with waste management or wastewater treatment, uh, all of these uh, sectors have various interventions. These interventions don't have to be invented. We know how to do them. The uh, technologies exist. They're on the shelf now. They have a cost, a real cost, and we have to consider that. Uh, there are definitely capacity constraints. So doing all of these things everywhere around the world is not necessarily easy. But um, these are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about. What if we did undertake those measures? What is the benefit? And this is where I'm going to get graphic for a second, because my graph here will show you that um, if you look at the difference between our reference curve here, this is showing temperature impacts through 2050, 2060. Temperature impacts uh, as a result of um, CO2 equivalent, uh, sorry, temperature impact uh, over time. And this is the, the temperature impact uh, uh, as observed and projected using climate models moving forward under the reference case conditions, which means we don't mitigate any CO2 or methane or black carbon beyond what is already agreed to. Now, we've already undertaken some things, so you can see that even in the reference case, um, you know, there, it, it's not necessarily continuing this um, exponential increase, uh, but it's not going down. It, we're heading into the danger zone very rapidly. The blue curve is what if we undertake these methane and BC measures? Well, what we found in 
and I say we, it wasn't me. The UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization undertook an assessment in 2011 to look at the potential benefits of short-lived climate pollutants. And they found a half a degree of warming could be avoided uh, by 2050. If you look out in 2050, you see you got about, uh, actually even maybe a little bit before that, you get about a half a degree benefit. Things are about half a degree cooler uh, under an SLCP mitigation scenario than they would be under the reference scenario. But as some in the scientific community would be very quick to point out, it's not really helping things because you're still heading up. <laughs> things are still getting into the danger zone. All you've done is maybe buy a little time, bought another decade. And this is where I think some uh, of the scientists who are advocating for short-lived climate pollutant reductions are misunderstood. Nobody is advocating we do SLCPs on their own because you're absolutely right. It wouldn't make sense to just buy a little time. What we need to do is undertake CO2 measures as quickly as possible. That's this purple curve. The CO2 measures would start to bend the curve back into a safer level of warming. Frankly, they're, you know, the safest level of warming is zero and that we've already missed. We're already at one degree now and we're heading towards Two, if we aggressively mitigate both SLCPs and CO2, but more likely we're heading towards, uh, you know, three or four right now. So the key is to look at uh, both CO2 emissions mitigation as well as SLCP mitigation. And in fact, what you're looking at in the difference between these two curves is avoided human suffering, avoided benefits to humanity. We don't have to go through this period of three or four decades. On the way to mitigation, which, you know, believe me, I know we're a long way from actually doing anything about CO2, and we need to be doing that. We're working on a global, global deal. International negotiations are underway. Hopefully by 2015, people will come to their senses. Governments around the world will come to their senses and start to mitigate CO2. Uh, and while we're on our way to mitigating that uh, CO2, there's a lot of additional human suffering that could be avoided. What do I want to do? I want to change slides. So this is just showing, uh, you know, recently there's been a little bit of detente between the scientists who were advocating for SLCP mitigation and the scientists who were saying this is dangerous to talk about SLCPs as people are going to take their eye off the ball on CO2. Uh, they finally have uh, come together. This paper was published in Science recently. Uh, Dan Schrag at Harvard and uh, Ramanathan uh, agreed that uh, the ideal solution is this hybrid uh, climate mitigation scenario that includes both CO2 and SLCP mitigation. And it's uh, sort of showing the same thing, uh, but uh, going out uh, a couple hundred years. So what, uh, coming back to the World Bank, how does that affect us? And I'll pick it up here a little bit because, um, you know, I don't think you really need to know all of the different activities that we're involved with just to say there are a lot of things that the World Bank is involved with. We, we lend $50 billion a year uh, for various development efforts around the world. Uh, and a number of these activities have an impact either on black carbon, uh, shown here in gray, an impact on methane, shown here in green, or in some cases like flaring, an impact on both. Flaring, if you're talking about flaring in a solid waste setting, uh, converting the, the methane that's released from solid waste dumps or sanitary landfills uh, to CO2 has a strong mitigation benefit because CO2 is less powerful, less potent than methane. But at the same time, you can see the black carbon coming off that flare. So flaring re uh, oxidizes, I was going to say reduces, it actually oxidizes the CO2 to, uh, methane to CO2, but it also releases a lot of black carbon. So we got to look at some of these trade-offs. Uh, but we're involved in a lot of different activities. These activities are taking place all over the world. These are just showing the World Bank regions, Africa, East Asia, Pacific, uh, Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, Caribbean, uh, Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. Uh, in each of these regions, we're funding uh, a lot of uh, funding. We're, we're, we have commitments to uh, work with our partners on activities, uh, and there's uh, $18 billion of investment over a six-year period, we found, uh, that's relevant to SLCP emissions. So we believe that at the World Bank, there's a lot we can do about um, short-lived climate pollution, and one of the reasons we're glad to be a partner in CCAC and try and do something about it um, as soon as possible. In order for that to happen, we do need to um, 
transform as much of our portfolio that's SLCP relevant to SLCP reducing. Now, I want to, the report that I really want to talk about, that's you know, basically what came out of this report, Integration of Short-Lived Climate Pollutants and World Bank Activities. We did this portfolio review and found that we're doing a lot. But what I really wanted to talk about uh, for a few minutes is the cryosphere, snow and ice. On thin ice, how cutting pollution can slow warming and save lives. And uh, one of the findings that came out of the uh, UNEP assessment in 2011 that was so interesting was that reducing black carbon and methane emissions doesn't have the same effect everywhere. Uh, unlike CO2, which sort of you know, has global impact, um, black carbon in particular is more regional, right? It only stays in the atmosphere for a couple of weeks, so a lot of it gets deposited or rained out relatively quickly. And uh, what we found is that reducing methane and black carbon, reducing all of these measures, doesn't have nearly as much benefit. That is, you know, showing the temperature reduction. It doesn't cool uh, the southern hemisphere very much. Still have a benefit. That's good. Uh, what is that? You know, two tenths of a of a degree. Uh, this is talking about globally average, or in this case, zonally average. So for all of those latitudes uh, south of 20 degrees, uh, 20 degrees south. Um, it does, the average benefit is not as strong, but it's still pretty significant given that we've had one degree, you know, two tenths of that could be, um, uh, of future warming could be reduced. Um, but in the northern hemisphere, it's exactly the opposite. That's where all the black carbon pollution is. So if we reduce the black carbon pollution in the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere would cool a bit more. What we didn't understand is what's going on in the Arctic. There's not a lot of pollution up in the Arctic. Not a lot of people, not a lot, you know. Why is the Arctic having such a strong response? Twice the global average. Well, the answer comes, uh, is shown here. Uh, there was an EPA report to Congress on black carbon and, uh, you know, what would be the climate benefits. And in addition to sort of the more uniformly scattered benefits of reducing black carbon from its direct absorption, as black carbon floats around in the atmosphere and gets mixed around, wherever it is, it's absorbing heat and warming the atmosphere there. But it also settles out. And depending on where it settles out, if it settles out on a white surface, like where there's snow and ice, it darkens that surface. Now, all of a sudden, you have not only the atmospheric effects, but you have these surface effects. You're changing the color of the surface. And it turns out that snow and ice, which is one of the most reflective surfaces on the planet, you can see sort of a shadow here. Uh, I don't know how clear it is in, in this graphic, but uh, the darkening of the snow and ice, and especially in glacial regions that are close to high population areas. I'm going to go back for a second and say, where is all the black carbon being emitted? Well, South Asia, India, guess what that's right next to? The Himalayas. Well, where are the snow and ice impacts most significant? Right along the Himalayas, Mongolia, uh, Siberia, these areas where you have lots of people and lots of snow and ice. Um, this uh, image on the right here is showing, oh, whoops, is showing layers of black carbon and uh, in some cases soil that has deposited on. So you can see how it darkens uh, and over time um, that uh, People have done a, a little coring of the snow, gone down in terms of the snow uh, depth and found correlations between black carbon concentrations and these events where you had very high black carbon in the black or soil. Uh, iron is an indicator of soil uh, in the red. But so it's interesting that you have these layers. Anyway, that's the mechanism going on. And um, so we did work with our partners at the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative, who are very focused on uh, Arctic regions, snow and ice regions, preserving the cryosphere. Uh, we uh, brought together the same modeling team that had done the UNEP assessment. And this time we said, all right, let's, let's do a, a modeling run where we look at the same measures, the exact same black carbon and methane measures, and we say, what can the benefit be? But let's not look everywhere. Let's look at these five regions, the Arctic, the Antarctic, the Himalayas, the mountains of East Africa, where, by the way, the snows of Kilimanjaro are almost gone and there's virtually uh, nothing we can do to preserve the, the cryosphere in, in East Africa. It's, it's pretty much 
Uh, it's going very rapidly. Uh, and the Andes, the, the mountain peaks of uh, South America. Uh, the same measures, I won't uh, go into what those measures are again, but uh, I want to show you the result. What we found, um, and uh, this is two charts that came from the study, and it's showing the, the forcing on the left and uh, the temperature response on the right. So uh, in animation, uh, just to help you understand what that means, uh, basically where it's dark on the left, these shaded regions were Primarily, remember, this pretty much corresponds to where the source region was for black carbon. But uh, methane has a more, uh, a more global footprint. Uh, where there's less heat being absorbed, down here where the sources are, the impact or the result is that you have cooler temperatures in a very different location, the Arctic and the Antarctic. So it again, just you know, the key modeling result here, the key well, not the message, the key modeling result is that reductions of black carbon and methane could significantly decrease the threat of rapid cryosphere change. Now, why do we care about the cryosphere? We're a development bank. Well, there are, I think, nearly a billion people living very close to the Himalayas. So the, the changes that are happening in the cryosphere around the Himalayas are going to strongly affect water availability, agriculture, in the Gangetic Plain, in uh, the Tibetan Plateau, and as it uh, filters down, you know, uh, there are strong impacts on development. So uh, we're interested in preserving the cryosphere for uh, climate reasons as well. Uh, if permafrost starts to melt more rapidly than it already is, huge possibility of methane feedback, additional climate warming. Um, there's already massive infrastructure disruption in places like Alaska, in Siberia. Uh, that just um, is going to be, become worse. Um, so the, the key modeling result really is focused on this uh, preservation of cryosphere aspect. But the key messages and takeaways that we drew from this study in terms of development and again, bringing it back to our theme uh, of development and climate change. Uh, you know, unprecedented change is taking place uh, in the cryosphere, uh, regions of snow and ice. Uh, fast action to cut uh, soot uh, as well as methane can have a large benefit for the climate, which has other development implications, but also save millions of lives in terms of local development benefits. These measures, these interventions have strong health benefits, have strong agricultural benefits, and several other uh, benefits. Fuel efficiency, energy uh, security, food security. Uh, so last slide on messages, climate actions in key economic sectors offer potential development benefits. This is our theme again. Uh, and SLCP reduction significantly decrease the threat of rapid cryosphere change, but the window for action is closing fast. If we're going to make a difference, we need to make that difference now. It's not, uh, you know, people are, are dying from air pollution today. Uh, the impacts from climate change are just going to increase over time. And as I say, black carbon, we can have an immediate impact. Methane, it takes a decade. Um, all of these things require quick action if we want to achieve greater benefits. The longer we wait, the less benefit there will be in undertaking these actions. And this is just to underscore the health benefits one more time. This shows the uh, estimated avoided premature mortality in uh, nations around the world from the combination of all of these actions. Uh, you know, nearly 400,000 lives saved each year in China alone. Uh, 670,000 lives in India, uh, even right here in the U.S., 24,000. So uh, significant uh, health benefits from these measures. Uh, and uh, this slide just summarizes some of the points I've already made in terms of the local development benefits. This is why our partners, our client countries, are interested in this. Uh, and we're working with several organizations to better understand the science and uh, in use that science to inform decision-making and, and development programs. Um, 
work to strengthen the analytical basis for uh, taking action on SLCPs so that uh, we really are sure uh, that we understand, for instance, some of these trade-offs between organic carbon and some of the co-pollutants uh, to ensure that we undertake them in regions where it's going to have uh, both a climate and health benefit or uh, at least do no harm on the climate where we know it has a strong health benefit. Uh, and uh, I'll just stop there. Getting me kind of Thanks. And I'm happy to take questions. I don't know if you want to. Anybody have any questions for them? Um, the best thing to do is to solve that. <laughs> Well, it depends on who the we is. Um, what we're doing at the World Bank, as I mentioned at the outset, is trying to, I mean, we have several things that we're doing, but we're trying to uh, mainstream climate change action into all of our programs, as, as I indicated in one of the slides. We're looking through the climate lens increasingly on all of our projects, so across our programs. Uh, in fact, there's a, a reorganization that's going on right now within the World Bank, and the climate group has been designated as a cross-cutting solutions area. And it's cross-cutting because it will cut across all of our global practices. Uh, our global practice on energy, our global practice on transportation, on food, on agriculture, on uh, education, gender issues. Uh, well, no, actually gender is another, uh, gender inequity and, and fragility and conflict are other cross-cutting solutions areas. But these are areas where uh, the president and, and the management of the World Bank see it as affecting uh, all aspects of our, our business, everything we do. Uh, so mainstreaming climate change into our programs is one aspect of it. As I mentioned, strengthening, strengthening the analytical base, uh, trying to better understand how our projects, our activities that we fund, how they influence not only SLCPs but also CO2, uh, we're undertaking greenhouse gas accounting. This is new at the World Bank. We're going to establish our greenhouse gas footprint, not just our internal footprint as an institution, but our lending portfolio's footprint. Other international financial institutions are doing the same thing. We're all moving towards uh, that direction. Uh, president Kim, uh, the president of the World Bank, announced last year at uh, the annual meetings, which are going on right now, by the way, uh, this week, uh, our annual meeting is happening in Washington. And about a year ago, I think he announced that we would um, virtually never fund coal-fired power plants. And I say virtually because, you know, there may be some exceptional circumstances where we uh, find that energy uh, security uh, may outweigh some of the climate risks, but. By making that virtual commitment, you know, that commitment to virtually no new funding for coal-fired power plants, it set an important precedent. Other international financial institutions have followed. Uh, the United States uh, Export Bank has, uh, under executive order, has followed suit as well. President Obama has followed suit, and uh, although I don't know that he would say he was following us, but, you know, uh, it's, I think that being an early leader and an early voice in this arena coming out with knowledge products like uh, Turn Down the Heat, um, it is having an impact. And I think that what the management of the World Bank would say is it's not so much the $50 billion a year in lending that we make in terms of commitments to our partner and client countries. It's the trillion dollars or more each year of private sector money that's leveraged by those initiatives. When we make a loan to a country, we generally only fund 20, 30, 40 percent of a project. The vast majority of that project, it depends, you know, it varies by project type. A lot of the money, though, it comes from uh, the governments themselves or private sector partners. So leveraging a trillion dollars a year in climate smart directions maybe has a significant impact. Now there's also what we're doing externally. And uh, Rachel Kite, who's a uh, our, my vice president, um, she is, has a dual title. Not only is she head of the climate change group internally, she's also a special envoy on climate change. And externally, she's doing a lot, meeting, you know, participating in World Economic Forum in Davos, participating in UN summits, 
um, in New York and uh, the UN COP, a conference of parties that happens every year, uh, participating in negotiations, trying to see how we can help scale up finance on a global level to help international uh, decision makers make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. That's how we're trying to help, but I mean, there's a lot that others can do too. Yeah, I'm not going to speak to U.S. emissions. I think if you were to ask folks in the White House how they're doing, um, in fact, we had uh, a meeting uh, about a month ago where the, somebody from the White House came and spoke and did a very eloquent job of saying that they're, we're doing great um, in terms of executive actions and what the administration can do without the help of Congress because we do not have uh, a supportive partner in terms of... Uh, in my view, we, uh, you know, the U.S. does not have a supportive partner uh, in Congress right now in terms of uh, meaningful climate legislation. Uh, any attempts at meaningful climate legislation have not really gone anywhere. And uh, so uh, the president is uh, acting with executive actions and um, administrative uh, regulations, administrative approaches that he can take. And uh, you know, they set a target of 17 percent reduction by 2020, and I think we are pretty close to meeting that. Whether that's enough is another question. And um, I think a lot of people will be looking uh, to the US, to China, and to the EU to see what they are willing to put on the table in terms of bold, ambitious actions in the spring of 2015 prior to uh, Paris. Uh, the Conference of Parties in December every year uh, is where international negotiations really take place. And, I think for something meaningful to happen when the new climate deal is supposed to be signed in December of 2015, we need to see some bold, ambitious proposals by spring of 2015. Um, and, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm an outsider to that process, the international negotiation process. I'm more of a scientist focusing on uh, trying to better understand what we can do, but um, uh, from the negotiating realm, uh, you know, my, my sense is people are working very hard and it's not, it's really just a matter of political will. It's not a matter of can we do it, it's will we do it. Um, and we'll have to see. Uh, the second part of your question about offshoring emissions, uh, yeah, that's something that's been looked at a lot and there are a lot of people talking about alternative accounting metrics that try and take into account some of your offshore emissions, you know, for especially Western Europe and uh, the U.S. Uh, should we be really patting ourselves on the back if our emissions are going down only at the expense of countries like China where a lot of our goods are manufactured? Um, there are, as I say, a lot of people looking into that and new accounting methodologies are talked about, but I don't know whether people will actually be so bold as to adopt um, accounting metrics. I, I think it's going to be hard for the U.S. to start taking responsibility for emissions that are occurring outside their borders. But certainly, I think there are ways that um, shareholders, I think, are asking companies to start taking responsibility for their emissions that are attributed outside. Because global, you know, corporations tend to be more global <laughs> these days. Well, uh, huge economic ramifications, I don't know. I, I mean, yes, there are certainly economic ramifications to that kind of decision, and energy security is a huge priority. We understand the need that countries need energy to develop. The question is, are there costs imposed by coal-fired power that will undermine the, economic, the very economic growth that we're trying to achieve? And 
when you start accounting for those costs that have traditionally been thought of as externalities, um, maybe it's not such a good deal to buy the cheapest power available. So, in most circumstances, there are alternatives. And in fact, the costs of wind and solar are coming down now to the, fact, to the point where in many contexts, not all, but in many contexts, wind and solar are cost competitive with alternative, certainly with you know, natural gas in some places. So it's, it's a legitimate question. It's something that we are definitely looking at and the economics are not to be treated lightly, but uh, where we are focusing our knowledge products right now within the World Bank is looking at those economic questions. And actually a report that we are working on now uh, is looking into uh, trying to see what we can do about those externalities. Those, uh, you know, traditional economic analysis doesn't necessarily account for all of the benefits of emissions reduction. And uh, as I showed in this presentation, there are strong health benefits, there are strong agricultural benefits, there are strong energy benefits, energy efficiency benefits that come with many of the interventions that also reduce short-lived climate pollutants. So if we can start looking at those benefits, those added benefits, and properly account for them in economic analysis, I think we'll find that things are not, um, there are less huge economic ramifications than one might Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and advise, I need to turn this off. <laughs>